filled with buried treasure. And you know, I woke up this morning and I just felt God ministering to my heart and saying that He's going to do something good for me today. And you know, it's the Lord's Day, it's Sunday. I love Sundays. It's my favorite day of the week. And I believe God is doing something good for me. And God's Word is just powerful and it is wonderful. And I think God wants to do something good for all of us. I, I don't want that to sound like a slogan. I guess I just mean that. that let, let's let the Lord meet us today. Let's let the Lord minister to us today. In a few minutes, I'm just going to give an opportunity for people that would like to be prayed for for any reason at all. As a matter of fact, even if you like prayer and it's not even for you, maybe it's for somebody in your family, um, come on up, okay? And, and the elders are going to meet you and pray with you, and we're going to trust God for good things. We've been looking at John chapter 10, and John chapter 10, John chapter 9, it's the same context, the context of the man born blind. But in chapter 10, this controversy has reached a peak and the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders are so upset with Jesus because of some of the things that he said. And over, well, last week, we looked at two things from our text. There is, there is the confrontation that we looked at, and they come to Jesus. Finally, they come to Jesus and they say, go public. Are you God? Go public. Are you Messiah? Go public. Say it out loud. We want everybody to hear it. And of course, their real thought is, and we're going to take you to court and crucify you, and this is going to be our evidence that you blasphemed against God. Then we looked at the claim that Jesus made that ended with, I and the Father are one. When you see me, you see God. God, that great way out there God has come right on down here, is with you, is with us today, is right in this place today. An amazing claim that Jesus made, God is real in your life. Today I want to take a look at the charge, although I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the charge. And basically they charge uh, Jesus with blasphemy, profaning the name of God, lying about who he is, <clears throat> um, 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 basically, just, just it's like profaning the temple. In a minute, I'm going to talk to you again about what we talked about last week, how that a pig was altered on the altar of the temple. And, and to the Jew, saying that you are God when you are not is just as evil, just as awful, just as wicked, just the great profanity that sacrificing a pig would be. In verse 22, we saw last week, it is the feast of dedication time of year. It's winter time. It commemorates the rededication of the temple in Jerusalem on the 25th day of Kislev, um, 164 B.C. is when it originally took place. Now, we looked at the history of this last week. It's known as Hanukkah, and at Christmas time, usually on TV, um, at least the stations that will say Merry Christmas will say Happy Hanukkah as well. And while it doesn't always coincide exactly with Christmas time, it's in the winter of the year. It's known as the Feast of Lights to the Jews. It commemorates Israel's victory over the infamous Greek king, um, who was king of the Seleucid Empire, King Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He was king from the year 175 B.C. to the year 164 B.C. when he died. Um, he came in, ransacked Jerusalem. He, he um, killed many people, assassinated many of the Jews. He desecrated the temple of God. He sacrificed a pig on the altar, and then he set up a pagan altar in its place. And then he took a statue of Zeus right into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, where he set it up there, profaning the temple, and he outlawed, loud, outlawed Jerusalem excuse me, outlawed Judaism throughout all of Jerusalem, throughout all of Israel, making it illegal to worship Yahweh God, making it illegal to, to circumcise your male sons, making it illegal to worship in any way, even to pray to Yahweh God. He made it illegal to own even a, a, um, a copy of the Torah. Now, most people did not, but, but, but for those priests that had copies of it, he captured those, and he birthed them, and he destroyed them. Well, in, a, in 167, the Jews began to revolt. They were led by a priest by the name of Mattathias Hasmonean. 
Mattathias rose up along with his sons. The most prominent of them is, um, is his son Judah Maccabees. Um, and after three years of hit and run tactics, of guerrilla warfare, they retook Jerusalem and, and defeated the Seleucid army that was there, except that they had a little help from divine God because at, right at that time, Antiochus IV Epiphanes died. And therefore, the Seleucids withdrew and the, the Jews were once again back in control of their homeland. It was the 25th day of Kislev, 167, when Antiochus IV Epiphanes profaned the temple, was the 25th day of Kislev, the exact same day, three years later, in 164 BC, when they cleansed and rededicated the temple. There was only a small amount of purified oil that was available for the temple menorah. And, and it had to be purified. You just couldn't use any oil in the temple menorah um, or Hanukkah. And, and, um, and so according to tradition, the little bit of oil they had, which was less than a day's worth, continued to burn for eight days until more purified oil was obtained and brought into the city. And as a result of that, today the Jews, to this very day, the Jews celebrate the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah for eight days, commemorating that period of time. Now, the context that we're in here is quite intriguing because it was the time of year that all Israel remembered the Maccabees. Remember I told you his name was Mattathias Hasmonean, but he became known as Mattathias Maccabees, which means the hammer, okay? And, um, and so it was that time of year when they remembered, they celebrated Hanukkah in, in our terminology. Um, they, they remembered the Maccabees who rose up against the oppressor, who defended them, who brought victory to their land. But Maccabees, but, 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 but Mattathias Maccabees never claimed he was the Messiah. They hoped, they hoped he was the Messiah, that he would defeat all of the enemies and that the kingdom of Israel would rise up and be great once again. But it only lasted for eight years. The Maccabean era came so swiftly, passed so quickly. And Jerusalem was still under the oppression of a conqueror. By the time of Jesus, Jerusalem and Israel was under the oppression of a different conqueror. There was a series of conquerors. And now, rather than the Greeks or the Seleucids, it was the Romans that were, that were in control of Israel. Isaiah had a few things to say about Messiah. And Isaiah prophesied, and he said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because Yahweh has anointed me to bring good news to those with afflictions. He has sent me to comfort those with broken hearts, to proclaim freedom to those who are held captive, to open the door to those who are imprisoned by their past, to comfort all who mourn. The prophecy of Isaiah that said, this is the day of the Lord. This is the day of Messiah. Let me ask you today, do you need to be comforted? Do you have a broken heart? Are you being held captive by someone, something, some event, some circumstance, some sin, some memory of the past? Are you being imprisoned by it? And do you need to be set free? Do you mourn? Is there something that the Lord needs to do for you today? Jesus, at the very beginning, beginning of his ministry, the Bible tells us, went into a synagogue in Galilee. And in the synagogues, there is a reading of scripture that begins their time of study together. And it happened to be this very passage from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The scripture passage was read from the Holy Scroll, and then Jesus stood up. After that very passage, actually Jesus sat down, because he sat down to speak in Jesus' day, and he sat down and he said to the people, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus came to comfort the brokenhearted. Though Jesus had shown the Pharisees, the Jews, the people of Galilee, the people of Samaria, the people of Jerusalem, the people of, of, um, of Judah in the south, though he'd shown all the people great things, so many of them refused to believe. 
Let's read about it in our scripture. If you'll stand together with me. John chapter 10, verses 22 to 33. We read some of this last week, but I'm going to reread it. It says, Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, for profaning God. Because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Pray with me, Father. As we pause now, to gaze into your word and discover the hidden treasures of it. I pray for each and every person, every soul, every life that's here today. Lord, some of us need for you to do great and mighty things for us. I pray that our hearts would be open to you, that you would be free to move in this place. Touch our lives, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So the charge against Jesus is very simple. They're charging him with blasphemy. He said, I've shown you many great miracles from the Father. <coughs> for which of these do you stone me? But look at their answer in the text with me. And by the way, I'm going to have you look up a bunch of scriptures with me today. I'm going to try to be a little bit patient because a lot of times I can turn the pages of my Bible faster than you can because you, you learn speed turning Bible pages and something. Okay. And, 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 uh, but I, I do want you to see some things as we progress here. But I want you to look at their answer. We're not stoning you for any of these. Any of what? Jesus said, I have shown you great miracles. Now I'm going to come back to that because that's the hidden treasure we're going to see in a moment. Jesus said, I've shown you great miracles. They say, well, we're not stoning you because of the miracles. They're acknowledging the fact he did the miracles, folks. They're saying, but you, a mere man, claim to be God. That's what we're going to stone you for. Notice that they don't deny that the miracles are real. Notice that they don't deny being witnesses themselves to some of his miracles. And notice that they don't deny that lives were indeed changed. We're still in the presence of the blind man, the man who was born blind in his 30s, and all of a sudden he could see. What a miracle, what a life that was touched of God, a life that was changed, a life that was helped. Have you ever thought... If you only lived in Jesus' day, if you could walk with him the dusty trails of Galilee, walk with him through the dirt-packed roads of Jerusalem, see him touch the leper, see him heal the blind, see him raise the dead, if you could see it with your own eyes, oh, you would believe. But they didn't. They saw it and they still refused to believe. Because the enemy had so hardened their hearts. And they say to him, you're just a mere man. Even in their own conversations they had a discussion over how can a mere man do these things. But they're stuck on the fact that they think he's just a mere man. Why did they doubt when they had seen such great things? Look at the evidence. Jesus says, I have shown you many great miracles. And here's the hidden treasure. Here's what I want you to see. In the Greek, the phrase great miracles is beautiful things. Beautiful things. I want to talk.
talk about beautiful things today. I want to talk about the beautiful things that the Lord does in people's lives. I want to talk about the beautiful things that the Lord may want to do in your life today. If only you will let him. You see, just before his crucifixion, I want you to understand this word beautiful things. Just before his crucifixion, and we are to the point in John where we, we turn the corner and in chapter 11, we come to the death of Lazarus and then everything that follows after that centers around Passion Week in Jerusalem. So John has spent the first 10 chapters leading up to his crucifixion and from chapter 11 on, he talks about the events that went on that week. In the presence of Jesus, one of the things that happened was that Jesus was in a home in Bethany. And Mary anointed Jesus' feet. The scripture tells us in our new versions that she anointed Jesus with pure nard, which is an expensive perfume. Spike nard, if you grew up with the King James, is the word that's used there. The amount of pure nard that, Jesus, that Mary used for Jesus was a year's salary. So just think however much money you make, that's what it would cost you to go out and buy the pure um, anointing nard that Mary used for Jesus that day. In the presence of that happening, there was one who was there, it was Judas. And Judas cried out, why this waste? This could have been sold and the money used to feed the poor. Jesus said, the poor you have always with you. And then he said, she has done a beautiful thing for me. Same Greek word, folks, as when Jesus said, I have done many great miracles among you. I have done beautiful things for you. She has done a beautiful thing for me. Jesus wasn't saying he hadn't done miracles. I'm not saying that if you weren't miracles, I am. But it was way beyond just miracles. It was beautiful things that the Lord had done. And I want you to consider with me the beautiful things that Jesus had done um, in the book of John. And just quickly, I'm going to go through this. Number one, we saw the beauty of his patience in John chapter 3. There was a man, a member of the Sanhedrin, a leader of the Jewish people, and a teacher, a rabbi. And he came to Jesus by night because he was afraid that others would see him coming. And he came to Jesus by night and he said, I know that, that you are a man sent from God, but I don't understand what's going on. And Jesus sat down with him very patiently. Read through again, John chapter 3. Jesus sat down with him and walked him through the purpose of God coming to earth in the form of a man being Messiah to the world. John chapter 3 verse 16, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only son and whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He said that to Nicodemus as he was explaining his great truth and his great purpose. Then he said, for God sent his son not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It was a foreign concept for a Jew to understand the world being saved, folks. Because the Jews didn't want the Gentiles in the mix. They didn't want Gentiles to be brothers with them. But Nicodemus, before we get to John 3:16 and 17 and 18, before we get to that, Jesus very patiently looks at Nicodemus, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing that he says. Because he's it's the beauty of his patience. And he looks at Nicodemus and he says, How can you, a teacher in Israel, not understand these things? Sometimes you have to sit down with a teacher of the law, a Jewish teacher of old, and be patient, and loving, and caring. And you see, sometimes it's hard for us. And I want you to understand the beauty of Jesus' patience with you. See, we look at one another, and we kind of have an agenda for folks in the church, you know, and even outside the church. We have an agenda. We want people to progress, to grow, to spiritualize at our rate of development. Jesus takes you by the hand, leads you along, and 
and he's patient. The second thing I want you to see is the beauty of his understanding. Wow, is John chapter 4 an amazing chapter? It's a Samaritan woman. It's the story of a Samaritan woman, folks. Samaritans were detested by Jews. And women, especially Samaritan women, were considered less than a dog. But Jesus is going on his ways, traveling to Galilee from Jerusalem. He passes through Samaria. Well, the Jews didn't pass through Samaria. As a matter of fact, if you look in the text, and I'm not going to take a lot of time to go there, but if you look in the text, it said that Jesus had to go through Samaria. You ever wonder why he had to? Let me tell you exactly. Because there was a Samaritan woman at a well that needed him. The beauty of his understanding wasn't judgmental. It wasn't cruel. It wasn't standoffish. He reached out to her. And he said, give me a drink. And she said, how can you, a Jew, ask me a Samaritan for a drink? Jesus said, if you only knew who I was, you'd be asking me. And I'd give you an eternal gold of water that would last for eternity. Eventually, Jesus says to her, go and call your husband. She said, well, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you're right. You've been married four times, and the guy you're with right now isn't your husband. In fact, you're just living with him. Jesus understood. Jesus understands that we are human beings. Now, I'm not excusing sin. But Jesus wasn't judgmental. He laid hold of her, and he brought her from where she was to where he wanted her to be. And she went rushing into the city and said, Come and be a man. Come and be a man. The beauty of his understanding that he works with us and takes us from where we are to where he wants us to be. How about the beauty of his compassion? I love this. This is something I've studied for years and years. It so amazes me. Here's the thing. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time, generally speaking. I think this might have changed for me on 9-11 when the World Trade Towers were attacked. But I always had a hard time having compassion on large, large multitudes. You see, if you're hurting, if a child is crying because they fell down and hurt themselves, I can pick that child up and comfort them and have compassion. But when there's 10 million people dying of starvation in Africa, it's harder for me. Now, I understand the need. But it's harder for me to identify compassionately with that many people. It's like, like overwhelming. It's like information overload for my brain. I think on 9-11, I changed a little bit with that as I had compassion on, what, 3,500 people. And it certainly made me see the compassion of Jesus from a different perspective. But you see, Jesus could look on a crowd with compassion. And the word that's used in the Greek is the same word as when Jesus had compassion on an individual. Jesus has the capacity to be compassionate to all the world. In, in uh, John chapter 6, Jesus ministered to what the Bible tells us, 5,000 people. We know it was 5,000 men plus women and children, probably 20,000, 25,000 people that were there. And it says he looked with, with compassion on the crowd. We read the exact same thing in Mark chapter 6, in Mark chapter 8. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus looked with compassion on the crowd that was Jewish. In Mark chapter 8, he looked on the compassion um, at the crowd that was Gentile. The first is the feeding of the 5,000. The second is the feeding of the 4,000. He looked with compassion on all of them. Those that were like him, those that were different from them. Just as he did with the Samaritan woman. She was not like the Jews. She was different, but Jesus' heart went out. Just like with Nicodemus. <laughs> He said, for God has so loved the whole world, the whole world, the Jews, the Gentiles, everyone, the beauty of his patience, the beauty of his understanding, the beauty of his compassion. Look at the fourth one, the beauty of his forgiveness. A woman <coughs> caught in adultery. 
they drag her before Jesus. You know, when we look at this passage, I explained to you all the, the background the information that we, we don't think that John wrote that at least at the same time as he wrote his gospel, that it may have been added in by the early church at some time, and there's a footnote in your Bible that speaks to that. In some of the earliest manuscripts, it's actually in the book of Luke, and others it's different places. In the Gospel of John, in one case at least, it's at the very end of the Gospel of John instead of in the eighth chapter. But here's what I know. Here's what I know. I believe this book. I believe this book. And I believe that God, through the Holy Spirit, led to where we are today with the canonized scripture. That if God didn't want it in the book, it wouldn't be in the book. It is in the book. And I see the heart of Jesus. I see the beauty of his forgiveness. The beauty of his forgiveness, a woman caught in adultery. Even adultery. Sometimes as Christians, we have categories of sin. Not in God's economy, folks. Not in God's economy. Jesus didn't shed a little blood for those of us that are pretty good. <coughs> And a lot of blood for those of us that are pretty bad. Jesus became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God through him. The beauty of his forgiveness. Wow. He forgives you if you will come to him for it. If you will ask of him, he will forgive you. It matters not what your past is. Our Lord is a redeeming Savior. He's a redeeming Savior. He's come to purchase us out of the bondage of our past and set us free and make us into a beautiful new creation, the beauty of His forgiveness. And the fifth thing, and the last one, is the beauty of His touch. And here we have it in John chapter 9. A man, blind from birth, and Jesus touches him. And makes him whole. There's days when I'm in prayer. And I will cry out to my Lord. And say Jesus touch me. I need you to touch me. You know one of the most comforting things as a boy I remember. And being hurt. Either physically or emotionally. Maybe somebody hurt my feelings. Or maybe I fell down and hurt my body. It didn't matter. Well, I know the greatest place on earth is when you're a little, little boy in mom's arms. <laughs> it doesn't get better, Dad. You know, there's times when my wife today will just reach over and touch me. Or I reach over and touch her, like John just did. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how you can communicate so much just with a touch? And here's where I'm going to have you look up some scriptures with me. Because I really want to talk about the beautiful touch of Jesus. I'm going to put them on the screen, but I'd really like you to go there with me if you would, okay? Matthew chapter 8. Let's just take a moment and go there. Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to have you doing a little bit of jumping around here. Matthew chapter 8, verse 14. Peter, yep. Yep, in case you didn't realize it. Yep, Peter had a mother-in-law. You don't get a mother-in-law unless you have a wife. <laughs> Had a friend years ago that never married. Great, great guy. Wonderful, wonderful teacher of the Word of God. Anyway, I asked him, I said, how come you never got married? He said, my mother-in-law died in infancy. <laughs> Boy, that's a sad day when that happens. Matthew chapter 8, verse 14, when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. What did he do? He touched her hand. And the fever left her. And she got up and began to wait on him. He just touched her hand, folks. You need Jesus to touch your hand today? Look at Matthew chapter 9, the very next chapter. Matthew chapter 9, verse 25. Well, let me back up a little bit. Verse 18. While he was saying this, I'm breaking into the context, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, now this is a ruler of the synagogue, knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died. 
come and what? Put your hand on her. That's all a man wants. He just says, Jesus, come and touch my daughter. Just come and put your hand on her. Drop down to verse 25. After the crowd had been put aside, he went in, took the little girl by the hand, and she got up. He just touched her. He just touched her. Look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 28. We're already in the context. Verse 27. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on the son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him and he asked them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, they Yes, Lord, they replied. And what did he do? He touched their eyes. And he said, according to your faith, it will be done for you. And their sight was restored. Let's go over to Mark in a second. Mark chapter 7. In Mark chapter 7, we find ourselves... In verse 33, we find ourselves in the um, Decapolis. It's ten cities, Gentile cities, on the eastern side of the Jordan. And Jesus is in Gentile territory. And in verse 31, then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee into a region called the Decapolis. And there some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged him to place his hand on the man. And after he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears, then he spit and touched the man's tongue. And he looked up to heaven. And he said, Be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly, and Jesus just touched him. Put his fingers in his ears, touched his tongue, and the man was changed forever. In Mark chapter 8, as long as we're in Mark, I'll only go to this passage. But in Mark chapter 8, we have the healing of a blind man. In John chapter 9, we have a healing of a blind man in Jerusalem. In Matthew chapter 20, we have the healing of two blind men in Jericho. Every one of them, Jesus just touched them. He just touched them. And he made them whole. Let's look at Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13 and verse 13. Verse 10. On a Sabbath... Jesus was reaching in one, was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years and she was bent over and could not straighten up at all. This was a crippled woman bent, unable to straighten up and walk. Oh, how life must have been miserable as she always made her way through the street and could only see the dirt below. And it says in verse 12, when Jesus saw her, he called forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. What did Jesus do? He touched her on her knee. Luke chapter 22, you don't need to turn there with me. You remember the story very well. They come to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Among them is the Malchus, the servant to the high priest. Peter pulls out his sword, knife, strikes at the man, cuts his ear off. And Jesus touched him and healed his ear, folks. Look at, look at Matthew 19 with me, because I want you to see this. Matthew 19 is such a beautiful passage of Scripture. Matthew 19, 13. 
says, Then little children were brought to Jesus for him, why? To place his hands on them and pray for them. You see, in our context, the rest of them, we're seeing people that had an infirmity of one kind or another. Some were blind, some were deaf, some were crippled, um, some were dead. Here, we're not told that there's an infirmity. People just come to Jesus to be touched. People bring their children to Jesus just to be touched. And he says, it says that they brought their children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And when he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. The little children touched by Jesus. See, sometimes we need to be touched by Jesus. Folks. The Bible says in James, is any trouble? Pray. Is any sick? Call for the elders. For them to anoint and lay hands on. And then it says that those who pray in faith will be healed. But you know the interesting thing about the word healed in the Greek? It's not, it's not just confined to a physical healing. It talks about weakness, distress, discouragement, depression, destitution. Some people need to be healed from anger. Some people need, need to be healed from their past. Some people know that they're forgiven, but the enemy just plagues them with what they have done in yesteryear. Some people need a touch in their emotions. Some people need to be healed of their fears. Some people need to be healed of their brokenness. Some people need to be touched because they're imprisoned by something. And they brought them to Jesus. <coughs> And he laid his hands on them, folks. He laid his hands on them and did beautiful things. What a powerful verse. <laughs> For which of these beautiful things do you stone me? Jesus wants to do something beautiful for us. Jesus wants to do something beautiful for you. Will you let him do it? You see, in Luke chapter 4, Mark, I'm just going to mention Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus comes to his own hometown. And it tells us that he couldn't really do anything there because of their unbelief. They said, we know this guy. We saw him grow up in our town. He can't be God. And Jesus couldn't do anything because of their doubt, because of their unbelief. Except that, it adds on, except for a few that he touched. In Luke chapter 4, it just tells us that Jesus was touching the multitudes, just the multitudes. We read in one case of a woman with a blood disease that reaches out only to touch Jesus. The touch, the amazing beauty of the touch. What do all those who were touched have in common? All those who were changed, what did they have in common? They allowed Jesus to come, or they went, but they allowed Jesus to minister to them. The woman with the blood of infirmity touched him. Beautiful things he did for all who would come to him. But you know about the Pharisees? He couldn't do anything for them. Why? Because they stood at a distance. And when you stand at a distance, a doubter and a skeptic, Jesus has a hard time making a difference in your life because you don't want it. But all those who were touched, all those who came, Jesus made a difference because they let him. Will you come near? Will you come near to Jesus? Will you come near and be touched by Jesus? So they wrote the words all around, hope is springing up from this old ground. 
of chaos life is being found in you. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of us. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I'm just amazed at the power of these words. You make beautiful things. In my hurt, <clears throat> you want to touch me and make a beautiful thing. In my sorrow, in my fear, in my brokenness, in my weariness, in my exhaustion, in my infirmity, in my memories, in my guilt, in my shame. You want to make a beautiful thing in us. And Lord Jesus, I pray today that we would not be like the Pharisees who stood at a distance, arms crossed, and say, no, not me. No, I won't go. Lord, if we need to be touched today, and I believe many of us do, Lord, I pray that we would come near to Jesus and be touched by you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Joe's going to lead the band.